bear with me because uh, uh, the video is not properly working today with me. So anyway, you you can hear me, I think. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. yes, sir. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Pratap, should I uh, start? Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, yeah, sir. We are live now. We can okay. go. Uh, you can start. We are live now. Okay. All right. Good. So, good evening, everyone, and many many thanks for joining. As you know, that we have uh, the webinar on a very important topic that is uh, on. Uh, forgetfulness and dementia, aspects of frailty, and about falls and fractures in elderly diabetics. And I think these are the, something which we all know. And while I wait for Dr. Akash uh, Singh, who will be sharing, uh, I would like to just say that uh, this is an important topic. And I think everybody has come across or does come across with these problems whenever they deal with elderly patients, particularly when they deal with diabetic patients. And uh, I'm very glad that uh, our faculty has agreed to contribute their uh, contribution in this webinar. So I think uh, uh, without any uh, ado, we can start in the meantime as Dr. Akash Singh joins, he can then uh, uh, start conducting the proceeding and uh, he would, as I told him before, he would be calling one by one the esteemed faculty members and the discussion will be towards the end for about 15 minutes. So I think uh, I would just first like to invite uh, Dr. Uh, Anand P. Ambali. Uh, he is a, a professor of geriatric medicine a highly academic person, has lots of contributions in particularly in various facets of elderly medicine. And uh, he very kindly agreed to take up the topic of dementia, including forgetfulness in elderly diabetics. And without further any spending time, I would request Dr. Ambali, the floor is yours. Thank you uh, so much, sir, for this. Just thank you so much, sir, uh, for uh, uh, your uh, introduction and uh, your invitation for me. Uh, I am extremely privileged to be amongst you all, and of course, of other uh, esteemed faculty members today evening. So, uh, greetings to you all from uh, Geriatric Clinic of Sri B.M. Patil Medical College. Am I audible, sir? Yes, you are. And slides are seen, yes. Pratap, sir, slides are seen, sir. Sli are my slides yeah. Yes, yes, audible yes. as well as visible. You can Thank you, ahead. sir. Thank you so much. So we uh, started our geriatric clinic way back in 2007, and now we are having two MD geriatric medicine seats uh, from 2021 uh, in the field of geriatric medicine. And apart from that, we also have a rural health scheme immunization clinic, dementia clinic, as well in our uh, geriatric clinic. So with this uh, background uh, and uh, uh, taking the permission of chair uh, and uh, moderator, sir, uh, I now uh, discuss a few things about uh, diabetes and uh, dementia or forgetfulness, as Russell rightly mentioned. So looking uh, at the next 14 minutes, so I'll be discussing how the diabetes leads to uh, dementia and uh, uh, what are the uh, identification signs, what is the role of caregiver uh, in this and uh, how to uh, uh, notice the behavior changes and find the solutions for that with the uh, take home messages. So we are all aware that diabetes is, uh, okay, we are becoming capital of the world. So one and one million, that's the latest numbers. And so is the aging population is increasing, 149 uh, million people in India. So uh, diabetes per se uh, leading to impaired cognition is on rise in older population. And uh, this impact uh, gives a negative impact on the quality of life of the older people. And over a period of time, once they develop full-blown uh, dementia, uh, their dependency level uh, increases uh, on the caregivers and they develop a poor quality of life. 
So as far as treating diabetes is also concerned, now most of the studies have come showing some uh, effect of some medicines, especially oral hypoglycemic drugs. They are more beneficial in preventing or delaying uh, forgetfulness or dementia in patients with diabetes, uh, while some uh, drugs are known for that, which we'll discuss. And of course, any uh, patient with diabetes now, uh, we can delay uh, or prevent the complication, especially the forgetfulness. As we are giving importance to the cardiac events and renal events and uh, are related to ophthalmic events. So uh, this uh, event should not be ignored. And that's why I think Professor Vinod sir has brought uh, this very important topic uh, regarding prevention of forgetfulness. Uh, and how that leads to other complications in diabetes. And the most important person uh, in treating the patients with diabetes is their family member or a caregiver, what we call, and by default, we all are caregivers for our grandparents. Now, looking at the prevalence of diabetes from the last year study, which was published, I think Sir was also part of this. So what is important here is uh, the uh, self-reported diagnosis of diabetes among the older people is between 60 to 74 is 14.9 and more than 75 is 11. So almost 26% of the older people among the study group uh, are having diabetes and most of them are in the urban areas. Now, we cannot ignore this 45 to 59 uh, people over 9.2% 9 9 because shortly uh, they will add to the 60 to 74 range uh, and the longer the duration, suppose uh, today a um, middle-aged man at 45 develops diabetes, at the age of 65 he is likely to develop uh, dementia uh, or at the 70. So there are all the challenges in coming years, uh, though we cannot ignore uh, any of these people developing diabetes at any age they are going to be challenged for the physician in a few decades. So the challenge, another challenge in uh, older persons is uh, people above 80 years. The number of people who are living 80 years and above is increasing and they will be not only having diabetes or all non-communicable diseases, but their complications uh, and requiring rehabilitation and palliative care. So in that, again, if they develop dementia, forgetfulness, a huge challenge for the family and the consultants. So diabetes leads to a dementia, deferred under depressions, dyslipidemia, diabetes, end organ damage, and disability. A lot of importance has been given to uh, all the Ds uh, from depression to disability, but not much was talked about dementia. So we will uh, explore how it can be assessed and what can be done in the coming years. So coming to the uh, new concept of this optimizing brain health by WHO, they say that brain uh, functioning across cognitive, sensory, socioeconomical, behavioral and domains, allowing a person to realize their full potential of life course, irrespective of presence or absence of uh, disorders. So that is where uh, uh, we as a physician strive hard. So optimizing brain health is very important because it is also an end organ. So improves mental and physical health. So creates a positive social and economic impacts and that contributes to the overall well-being and a good quality of life among the elderly people. Now, this concept that has been brought uh, uh, by WHO uh, says that looking at the uh, age, neuroplasty starts at the young age and diminishes as we grow old and pruning takes place in between and it disappears. While this is very important, the midlife neuronal loss starts and proceeds with the older age. And this is where most of the non-communicable diseases take part and even uh, other habits also take part in this course and they lead to dementia or forgetfulness in the older people. Even the Lancet when it brought the risk factors for cognitive impairment is a very beautiful uh, sh uh, picture showing how what are the risk factors at each age group. So the in the late life the diabetes is one of the uh, risk factor for developing dementia in the older people though it constitute only one percent Two things are very important in this. It is mostly preventable. Mostly the progress to dementia is preventable. And if it just 1% is, uh, maybe it looks small here, but looking at the number of older people in India and old people with diabetes in India, definitely this accounts to the larger number. So how diabetes leads to dementia? So diabetes per se can lead to uh, dementia. The medicines that we use in treatment can lead to dementia. The complications of diabetes, especially hypoglycemia, can uh, lead. And of course, genetic involvement, which is uh, weak, uh, we cannot divert or prevent those things. 
Now, looking at the uh, dementia, whether occurs in type 1 or type 2 diabetes, most of the older people have type 2 diabetes, but we do, we do still see type 1 in the older people. But in type 1 diabetes, the most of the slowing of mental speed takes place and memory and learning is not affected. While in type 2, psychomotor speed, executing the functioning and memory are largely affected over a period of time. So type people with type 2 are definitely prone for dementia. Now you look for why it is produced a lot of factors in type 2 diabetes, which leads to cognitive impairment like HbA1c. The larger the HbA1c, the, bone, uh, the brain volume starts coming down. Resistance to insulin and hyperinsulinemia. Hypo and hyperglycemia are extensively studied, known to produce uh, dementia. Hypertension, genetic depression, and most importantly, peripheral artery disease. If the person is with diabetes having peripheral artery disease, definitely he is bound to develop uh, dementia as well. Now, coming to neuroplasticity, the main center for all these activities for neuroplasticity is the hippocampus, uh, where there is a reduced neurogenesis due to diabetes. And this neurogenesis and the hippocampus uh, impacts on the learning and the memory uh, of the older people. And that is how the neuroplasticity uh, doesn't work as we grow old. But uh, can we uh, measure neuroplasticity? Uh, no, we cannot measure neuroplasticity in live patients. If only post-mortem helps to understand the hippocampal neurogenesis, whether it's taking place or not. Now, coming back to the pathophysiology, the mechanism through which hyperglycemia uh, affects the cognitive function, uh, it depends whether it is acute or chronic. So basically two things sets in. One is vascular pathology and second is degenerative pathology. Both combined together works in the pathogenesis of dementia in patients with diabetes. So acute hyperglycemia uh, leads to a reduction in cerebral blood flow that results in uh, changes in oxidative stress. And the, this leads to large number of reactive oxygen species, which leads to oxidation inserts and when the reactive oxygen species exceeds the antioxidant response, the neural damage occurs with the subsequent functional decline. This is how uh, pathogenesis occurs in acute stage. While in chronic hyperglycemia, there is accumulation of advanced glycation products uh, and this exacerbated uh, leading to the formation of ROS and pro-inflammatory cytokines which again leads to microvascular damages in the brain. And not only that, it also, the advanced glycation products accelerate amyloid beta depositions and plaque formations, which further leads, make the elderly prone for uh, Alzheimer's disease. Now, coming to hypoglycemia, a lot of studies have been done on the huge numbers of patients. Even one study shows to almost lakhs of patients were revealed. Hypoglycemia associated dementia with the odds ratio of 1.5. And another study uh, published in Diabetes Met 53,000 revealed 26% increased episode of dementia development with one episode of hypoglycemia, Why 50% increase in those who have multiple or recurrent hypoglycemia. So hypoglycemia leading to cognitive decline is very, very important uh, thing that we are uh, dealing with. We almost every uh, week, every month, we get one or two older patients coming with hypoglycemia. So that is how the impact is taking place. This is the another study which tells you where is the duration of diabetes anything to do with uh, the dementia? Yes, uh, the number of uh, years as you pass, the risk for developing dementia is more. In this study, it was very clear that uh, up to the five years of uh, diabetes less people are there and as the duration of diabetes increases the more number of people develop uh, dementia so earlier that that's what i told you that the people in between 45 to 60 now when they develop diabetes at the age of 70 when they come they will be having dementia now can we uh, take this as type 2 diabetes alzheimer's disease for all of us here all of you are known that but the audience here should know that it is still an unofficial to mention Alzheimer's to be a type 3 diabetes. But why the concept came? Because insulin plays a critical role in formation of amyloid plaques and phosphorylation of tau 
which leads to neurofibril tangus. So insulin resistance leading to type 2 diabetes and insulin resistant brain leading to plaque formation. That is the probable pathogenesis that has been described. So some authors mentioned it as type 3 diabetes, but it is still not an official thing. Now coming to the concept of which medicines that we use to treat diabetes can lead to cognition impairment or cognition improvement. So this is a study of one of the meta-analysis from 22 studies using seven medicines from DPP-4, sulfonylurease, metformin, insulin, pyoglitazone. And these darker thick lines tells that more number of studies have been done on these medicines. And what they form uh, over a period of time is the medicines that are protective, oral hypoglycemic drugs that are protective are metformin, pyoglitazone, and cetagliptine. They have found to improve and or delay the memory loss uh, or dementia, while insulin is known to produce uh, memory loss or dementia. Now, coming to knowing all this pathophysiology and all the when to screen, when the old person comes with a history or usually from the family members that he is not able to take care of himself, okay, and without obvious reason, then suspect that he some cognition impairment is there and evidence of end organ damage like stroke or cardiac events that can even further lead to dementia and duration of diabetes as i've been emphasizing history from family members of red flag sign the old man is forgetting some old lady forgets to off the gas stove uh, in the home or they misplace the things or they wander so many red flag signs are there and if that comes uh, history is there then we should definitely uh, enter into the uh, deeper examination and all older people above 70 years with uh, 70 years with diabetes not of with diabetes should undergo a screening at least once in a year though there are no clear cut guidelines but a lot of studies are telling that go for screening for di uh, uh, dementia as we screen for albuminuria and history of hypoglycemic hypoglycemic episode definitely makes the older person risk for dementia. So these are the various screening tools that we use in our genetic medicine, MMSC, MOCA. Uh, we, in our clinic, we use MOCA. We are very comfortable with that. Some uh, authors, they, they do Eden Brooks and some are comfortable with MMSC. Any one of this can be used. Now coming to the last aspect, what is the impact? So knowing that diabetes is there, yes, how it happens, yes, and uh, how dementia is going to be there, how it affects the First older person. So they. Dr. Ambani, the can you can you wind up uh, in next two three minutes, please? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So what are the uh, impacts? So difficulty recognizing the symptoms of hypoglycemia in older person is a very uh, negative impact on the patient's quality of life, and the complications are least described or identified. So if the older person is forget to monitor glucose, then decrease frequency, give the pill box or alarms to ensure that he takes medicines. And if the patient is having problem solving difficulty, so repeated education and repeated visits has to be done. If the patient is adamant that I don't want to change and he's stubborn, refuses for new therapy as much as possible, try to avoid and don't add new things for them. And difficulty with mental flexibility, they feel anxious or regarding failing the treatment plans. So simplify regimes as much as possible and avoid insulins if it is possible in this older people. Now, the most important person I told, caregiver training. We need to uh, train the caregiver regarding identification of red flag signs in them. Insulin dosage has to be monitored. Symptoms of hypoglycemia should be taught to them that we do, as a physician, we do that. Identification of behavior changes and pill reminder should be done. So exercise thus prevents uh, occurrence or delaying the uh, dementia in older people by ways it improves the neuroplasticity, working memory, cognition, and those. Even WHO is giving a lot of importance for dementia risk reduction, and that is what we are doing through this program. So the take-home message is there is a uh, multi-domain intervention in people with dementia uh, leading, uh, and diabetes because the diabetes itself is not a single entity, nor the dementia. It is a multiple components, and uh, multiple uh, team has to be worked. As much as possible, we have to avoid st stringent control by AIC and avoid insulin as much as possible unless uh, it is indicated so that hypoglycemia should not develop. Screening for cognition should be regular in all the older people, at least those who are 70 and above. Caregiver involvement is of paramount importance. 
and to retain sweet memory prevention is a key and of course the dementia and diabetes can uh, as a complication leads to falls fractures and frailty which will be discussed in detail by our next extreme speakers so with this i conclude and wish you all a very happy sankranti to you all and these are my references and thank you for your patience thank you dr ambali for in a limited time you have touched many aspects i was particularly impressed about the impact of dementia on diabetes with regard to the behavior and uh, all sorts of complications falling down getting fractured if you do not know about dementia in this patient so i think very important message has been given and now i think i would like to uh, welcome dr akash singh who is actually the chairperson of this webinar and he would be calling the speaker inviting them one by one and i just as i said in the beginning the discussion will take place and then for a senior consultant in medicine and diabetology in the city of vadodara diseases association and he has many awards and many publications to his credit he is very active in the rssdi and api and with this i would invite dr akash singh to kindly take over and invite the next speaker thank you thank you mr dr vinod kumar i'm sorry to join late uh, i will just like to have the slide of dr rabashi also for the next lecture the introductory slide of dr anubhasu vastav she'll be uh, dr anubhasu vastav is mbs md medicine uh, msc in neurology and has several fellowships to her credit several gold medal certificates and she is a coach in the acp wellness program and there also she has won a award so there are a host of awards which have been awarded her and she has been a very very regular speaker in all the national conferences in medicine diabetes and neurology and also a judge uh, for the post op presentation sessions and all so basically she is a, a very very acclaimed speaker and i would like to invite her to speak on uh, the uh, uh, next topic which is allotted to her dr arva shastri thank you dr akash for a kind introduction i would like uh, like to thank vinod sir pratap sir for giving me this important session on frailty i'll be share, sharing my slide and i'll go through uh, an important topic when we talk on diseases governing the or the challenges what uh, elderly is actually face uh, so i'll be talking on frailty in elderly diabetes uh as my previous speakers has very well mentioned about the increasing prevalence of the elderly population because of the advances in public health and modern medicine which is globally and the in india also the prevalence is high so we have a different issues a unique challenges especially in the older diabetic individual which were traditionally not seen so these challenges are medical psychological and functional issues a myriad of problems among which the previous speaker has talked about the dementia and depression definitely so these individuals the elderly individuals have two or more simultaneous long term health conditions which is in indian subcontinent around about 32.1% of older people have a multi morbidity associated with them so frailty to okay. define it is a progressive loss of reserve and adaptive capacity associated with overall deterioration in health if you see the prevalence of a pre frailty is much more common than actual frailty and if we diagnose if we routinely start screening our population definitely we can make a change as you can see this stage can very well be reversed to robustness it's a condition where there is reduced muscle strength a an unintentional weight loss loss of low energy expenditure slow walking speed and exhaustion i think most of the diabetic in a slightly elderly age group 65 70 may have these symptoms which if we do not question we may lack to identify a pre fail individual and hence we will land up in uh, these in disability and dependency so we are actually facing twin epidemics of frailty and diabetes of frailty which is the loss of biological reserves of across the multiple organ system 
So why we talk about diabetes and frailty? Because frailty is three to five fold higher among diabetics and is the single uh, biggest factor of mortality. Uh, frailty is a common finding. If we see an elderly population of 65 years, it ranges around 32 to 48%. And the frail older people with diabetes may suffer from malnutrition or sarcopenia. So the various risk factors which are already there on the background of inflammation may cause physiological organ changes and may produce signs of weakness, weight loss, exhaustion, low activity and slow performance. And this may not be associated. The, uh, they may have certain signs of dementia or Parkinsonism, but frailty is independent of uh, this diagnosis and hence the problems of falls, disability, dependency may be higher. So there is a shared pathophysiology between frailty and diabetes. The oxidative stress, the chronic inflammation, the sarcopenia, they all may result in, in uh, once the frail patient may have an independent risk factor for morbidity and mortality in diabetics and vice versa, the diabetic patient may have worsen complication and malnutrition uh, in diabetes. So if we see a patient, if we follow from the uh, from robustness where he's able to do all his routine activities independently to the exhaustion stage, and if if they lands up into if the progression is more, they may lead into disability. The metabolic syndrome, along with chronic inflammation, may produce a symptom of sarcopenia, loss of loss of muscle mass, loss of strength, loss of speed, and uh, loss uh, le leading to weight loss along with nutritional deficits and anemia. So there is a cascade of oxidative stress, aging and inflammation producing a multi-system dysfunction and frailty. That was about the pathophysiology. We are very well aware about the inflammatory, chronic inflammatory condition and the uncontrolled diabetes uh, deteriorating the situation. So why Talking about frailty is important in diabetes. You see, catching the patient in a free, uh, pre, uh, the pre frail condition is very important. What are the uh, higher risk of individual? The elderly patient, the female group, the patients who have not been better controlled, high BMI, high waist circumference, inactive smokers may are the one may have more. Uh, uh, going towards frailty and diabetes is associated with accelerated aging process that promotes frailty. So the complications, especially renal impairment and dementia may definitely pave the way for frailty. So the screening and assessment is very, very important. Detecting frailty in older people with diabetes is important to target intervention to reduce the functional decline and risk of debility. The uh, various key uh, assess assessment factors could include the physical performance, which we can, uh, which we'll be talking about, mental health and cognition, which docs have just talked about, and definitely the nutrition. So early identification of pre frailty is a potentially reversible condition. Some of the tools like the scoring index, the simple get up and go test, the Prisma tool, the sarcopenia, they can be helpful. Simply, if uh, we can ask one of the patient to get up from the chair, to walk around a three meter and, get, uh, and sit back. If he's able to complete for 10 seconds, he is still uh, active and they don't show any, uh, they are robust. Uh, another is a walk, uh, four meter walk test. Uh, if the uh, individual is able to complete within five minutes, uh, so he is uh, having robustness. So there is one of the criteria, the presence of the three or more criteria like difficulty in mobility, that is gait, slow gait speed, muscle weakness, the hand grip weakness, decreased physical activities and poor exercise tolerance, Exhaustion, which is self-reported, and unintentional weight loss. Just if we can ask five questions to a patient and assess uh, at the routine checkup, the presence of three or more may suggest a frailty. Two or more may describe a pre-frail state, and any of this absence may cause uh, may tell you about the robustness. 
So this uh, frailty assessment in diabetes can be done uh, uh, for the patient-related symptoms at any visits where this questionnaire or the questions can be asked. The four meet uh, gait speed test or a get up and go test can be there or a questionnaire can be used. And we can go for the testing about the neurological complication, the neuro uh, nephrological combination and assessment can be done. These are the questionnaire which I was talking about. Seven questions, uh, three out of seven may result, uh, may show that the patient is suffering from. This is a clinical frailty score. And obviously this can help us or uh, to give an idea about this patient may have symptoms of frailty. Uh, there is an overlap been sarcopenia where there is a skeletal muscle loss and poor muscle quality, which is just a, uh, an overlap to a bigger spectrum of weakness, slowness, physical functional impairment, fatigue, uh, deficits, weight loss. And this, there are lots of interrelated thing, uh, things which are resulting into it. The, the complications, the comorbidities, the uh, inadequate nutritional uh, intake, the low physical activity. Uh, for the sarcopenia, uh, for, uh, this is one of the uh, European Working Group guidelines on older people. Any individual, we can measure the gait speed, to measure the grip strength and assess for the muscle mass and can diagnose sarcopenia, which is a entity seen in the elderly age group. And polypharmacy is one of the uh, associated features with reality and multimorbidity. The principal causes of polypharmacy and early detection of reality, right choosing of uh, medication, simplification of their treatment chart may be helpful in a long way. So we have talked about what is frailty, what are the uh, pathogenesis, and now what can be done. So what are the target setting and the recommended intervention. So we can divide it into pre-frail individual, a moderate level of frailty, and a severe frailty. A pre-frail individual, the target should be reversal of frailty with a tight glycemic control and enhancement of resistance exercises and nutritional interventions. With the and the moderate, a glycemic control should be modest of less than eight. Assessment of cognitive decline should also be there in the checkups. The aim remains to uh, for the prevention of decline in the quality of life and prevention of microvascular complication. In the severe frailty, go for the modest uh, uh, prevention of hypoglycemia seems one, number one in uh, uh, aim with the Control of A1C less than 8.5 and prevention uh, and making them slightly independent. This is the standard of care, diabetes care 2022 uh, of the goals of the treatment and a modest level of blood glucose and blood pressure as the frailty level advances. So, so the mainstay of the treatment as of the diabetes specific in this population also is nutritional management, which is high calorie, high protein diet, uh, and which has shown, especially in heart failure patient, to improve the quality of life and six minute walk test. The micronutrient deficiencies, especially seen in frailty, include vitamin D, E, A, and B12. Thymine, iron, folate should also be suggested. So uh, a holistic checkups or workup can be helpful in assessment of comorbidities, the nutritional status of the individual. So there have been various studies which have shown if we diagnose the patient in the free pre-frail uh, uh, stage, the reduction in the frailty can be achieved with a structured exercise intervention and the various studies have shown uh, to it. So this, uh, the various types of exercises, the intensity, the flexibility, they can be advised according to the stage of the disease. Now it comes to the pharmacotherapy. After the diet, the exercise, this can also be evaluated in the three stages, the mild frailty, the moderate and the severe. According to the comorbid condition like the heart failure condition, atherosclerotic heart disease or the kidney disease, the choice of the drug 
of metformin dpp4 can dpp4 uh, seems to be a safer drug with less chances of hypoglycemia and any complication but if the atherosclerotic heart disease factors are present the role of sglt2 and glp1 uh, may be good enough if the a1c is controlled if the patient is on insulin the basal insulin and the dose reduction should be there uh, the avoidance of pioglitazone in heart failure patient and if the renal function deteriorates lesser than 30, uh, the choice of the drugs becomes linagliptin or the insulin as per the age. The moderately failed patient, similar, we have to maintain uh, around 8 uh, HbA1c with the choice of the drug according to the dependent upon the complications as well as the stage of the disease. Hypoglycemia should be uh, uh, prevented and sulfonylurea should be reduced or uh, discontinued as and when required. Choose a, sl uh, a, a slower dose of insulin, a longer acting insulin may be helpful. In severely frail individual, at any age, B1C, discontinue sulfonylurea, discontinue thylazolidones, and stopping metformin and GLP because there is loss, there's sarcopenia associated with it. So insulin may be a long acting, can be a good choice if there is no features of heart failure. DPP4 also seems to be a good choice. So this is one of our study which is done at our center where we have assessment of sarcopenia in type 2 diabetes and we are using CT-based uh, assessment of muscle mass and its association with complication. Around 100 patients, we found uh, around 37 patients having sarcopenia and out of this, uh, we had around 20% in elderly. So it is not so uncommon. To summarize my talk, when Cause talking about the therapeutics, start low and go slow. So the escalation and the disescalation of the medications are very important in frail older individuals and they need to be assessed uh, regularly. The focus on random blood glucose should be at 120 to 200 milligram per day through, instead of A1C targets. Hypoglycemia should be prevented Assessment of frailty should be routine component of diabetes review for all older individuals. Glycemic targets and therapeutic choices should be modified accordingly. And we have to eliminate both hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia. So this is one of the association of the British Society where the assessment, the care and the management should follow as such. Uh, just to conclude, Frailty rather than age determine the prognosis of older adults with diabetes and therefore a key determinant of target setting and treatment choices when individualizing care. So the, the glycemic treatment targets and de-escalation thresholds are generally accepted. Though they are not formal guidelines, but definitely there are certain do's and don'ts and we should follow that. Thanking you and happy Makar Sankranti to everyone from Prayagraj. Dr. Akash Singh. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Rava. That was a very uh, lucid and very crisp lecture. It is ch challenging for the healthcare providers to identify and address the epidemic of diabetes, dementia, and frailty in the aging diabetic population in India, which has genetic and epigenetic acquired factors in background. And this increases the vulnerability of this population to increased falls and fractures. And to uh, talk on this interesting topic, is none other than the illustrious speaker, Dr. Sanjeeva Reddy, who uh, needs no introduction. But if I can have the introduction slide, I would like to introduce him. Uh, he will be talking on this subject. Uh, Dr. Sanjeeva Reddy is consultant employees at Center for Diabetes Endocrine Care and Fortis Hospitals, Bangalore. And his short is, uh, uh, Introduction speaks for his immense humility. Uh, he is one of the tallest uh, figures in diabetology. I will request him to proceed with his lecture. Thank you, Dr. Akash. Thank you very much. Thank you for those nice words. Let Give me a minute before I share my slides. Hope it's visible. Sir, am I visible and audible? Yes, you are. 
Yeah, thank you very much. At the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Vinod Kumar and uh, Dr. Pratap for asking me to talk on uh, falls in the elderly with diabetes, risk factors, prevention and management. In the next 15 minutes, pardon me or stop me if I am taking a uh, if I uh, overshoot my time. And I thank the two speakers for setting the target on diabetes and dementia and frailty. I think frailty should be the one to uh, assess somebody who's elderly or not, according to me, but we'll take up that in the discussion. Now, this is what, uh, just looking at fall when you are normal, when you are not too elderly versus as you grow frail or where you grow elderly, how you fall. Just a, a picture predicting it. And what does epidemiology of the falls in the elderly say? After this, I'm going to talk about diabetes and falls, and then how do we prevent them? So any the easiest one is unintentionally coming to rest on the ground floor or other lower level from a, from another position uh, because of no major intrinsic activity. These are all definitions of a fall. And we've all experienced this uh, in our families. And what are the different types of falls? So we may have falls which can be triggered by intrinsic or extrinsic factors as a consequence of, uh, as this consequence of the fall, you can have injury, may not have major injury, they could be fallers, first non-fallers at all, but they can be once only fallers or recurrent fallers. So whatever the consequence of the fall is always not good in the elderly. Let's look at what happens. Accidents are the fifth leading cause of death in older adults. Forget about cancers. Now you're looking at all the infectious, non-infectious disease, um, malignancy, and the cardiovascular disease, and the fifth to largest cause for death in older adults account to two-thirds of these accidental deaths. One-third of adults over 65 in the community fall at least once a year. And we're looking at uh, Dr. Sivat's slide on how many people are going to become more than 60 uh, over a period of another 30, 20 years in our country. I think the ratio is going to be reversed from the age of 30 and 60, and we can imagine how many falls we will have. The raise of uh, this raises up to 50%, uh, half of the adults over the age of 30, uh, over the age of 80, tend to fall. And 5% of them result in a fracture or hospitalization. The mor morbidity abnormalities affect 20 to 40% of adults over 65 and 40 to 50% of adults over the age of 85. Mortality of those who are hospitalized, 50% will not be alive a year later. This is more dangerous than cancer. You have a major fall and if you're hospitalized. Falls constitute two-thirds of death associated with unintentional injuries. In 2000, traumatic brain injury accounted for 46% of the fatal falls. And the cost related to the fall, I'm looking at figures in 2000, between 24, you need not, this can be like billions of dollars, which I, it is around $19 billion. I don't know, I, you can't quantify the loss in terms of money alone, in terms of what the family goes through, what the, the, how much money the government incurs, expenditure, direct and indirect cost can be enormous. So epidemiology of falls in the elderly, where do falls occur mainly? Are they indoors, outdoors? Most falls occur outdoors. Women are likely to report more indoor falls. Indoor falls are associated with frailty. We just talked, we had a talk on frailty, and we see that people are frail or have more indoor falls. Outdoor falls, because when you're frail, you're not going outside more. So there's a reason for indoor falls and frailty. Outdoor falls are associated with compromised health status in more of the active elderly. Now, the rate of falls and their associated complications are star twice over the age of 75. 10 to 25 falls induce fractures in this population. Now, do all falls cause fra fracture? So 10 to 25 percent of them in seven, over 75 years of age. This is not data from the diabetic. I will present that too. Hip fractures are the most common after the age of 75. Those greater than 75 years of age are more likely to report indoor falls. Incidence of these are higher in institutional elderly, diabetes, Parkinson's disease, post-stroke, patients with neurological disease or disorders. Now, one of the largest study till date looking at the risk of hip fracture and non-skeletal fall injuries in the elderly. This was the frail post study. This was a Swedish study done from the Swedish registry, had more than 4,29,000 patients aged 80 
they looked at 80.8 plus or minus 8.2 years from the Swedish registry or the senior alert and linked the data to several nationwide registry. They identified 79,000 individuals with type 1 and type 2 diabetes, out of which 41 were on oral medications, 14 were on 14 <clears> percent <throat> with no anti-diabetic medication, and 45 percent with insulin. Now let's look at the data. What did uh, the conclusion of this, they looked at various factors. They looked at comorbidities, they looked at the association, whether what happens with type 2 diabetes and uh, this. And what the conclusion of the study was, it did lack a lot of data on uh, HbA1c level. It did, it did lack data on smoking. There were certain factors missing in terms of activity level, cognitive factors. But the conclusion of the study was patients with insulin-treated type 2 diabetes should indeed be considered as a high risk for future factors. But all patients with diabetes and any kind of anti-diabetic pharmacological treatment having as an increased risk for non-skeletal false injuries and may benefit from primary intervention strategy, primarily aiming at reducing the risk of one. So any diabetic for that matter, more so people with insulin who are on insulin are more prone for factors. And what they found was people on insulin had more rib factors and non other non-skeletal factors were more on people with OHS. So this is in and in duration of diabetes, there was not, and the longer the duration, they had an increased risk, but it was not statistically significant. One of the studies, now this was a retrospective data study. When we look at a prospective study, this prospective study was from get Now, which are these people? They, were, they looked at 199 older adults, 104 with di diabetes, and 95 health controls. All of them underwent medical gate, medical screening at, uh, at the time, and they were followed up for more than a year or so. Balance, grip strength, cognitive status, mini mental health examination, and clock drawing test. They did, a, uh, they did a, their cognitive function, their frailty assessment, and what did they find was Diabetes is a major risk for falling, even after controlling for poor balance, taking multiple medications, poor walking performance, and reduced cognitive functioning over the over a period of time with the duration of diabetes were mediators of the relationship between diabetes and falls. Longer duration and diabetes and taking a lot of diabetes medications or multiple diabetes medications, one was the associated factors. Now, taking all this, what are the risk factors for falls? This is uh, uh, the risk factor assessment taken from the WHO by uh, uh, a study of uh, by D'Souza et al., the Asian Journal of Gerontology and Geriatrics. So the most common predictors. So you know, we all know old age, all biological, environmental, behavioral, and social economic factors, including sex, race, age-related decline and strength, environmental factors, both extrinsic, intrinsic, biological, cognitive, so many factors are there. But which are the most common which may increase falls? The most common predictors of falls are abnormalities of gait and balance and the history of fall in the past year. If you look back at diabetes patients, majority of them who have neuropathy and a sensory deficit, they fall into this category. So it compounds the I have a number of falls when you have diabetes associated peripheral neuropathy behavior. So it's important that every diabetic, there is a risk assessment of peripheral neuropathy and you know, a correction of the factors with appropriate footwear may decrease a lot of falls. Behavioralist factors, including risky behaviors, socioeconomic risk factors include low income, low education, inadequate housing, and limited access to health care services. The extrinsic factors more likely to peak the course for fall for the age group 60 to 74 years. Outside factors and intrinsic factors for more than 75 years or old. That means by 60 to 75, you should be very careful for extrinsic factors, environment. When you go out, you, are, you tend to fall more in, uh, in, in uh, intrinsic factors which are responsible when you're more than 75 years old. So there's just a small distinction with these two. Now, in diabetes medicines and their increases for falls and fall-related uh, uh, mor morbidity, this is a 
study uh, from elderly Helen and Reed group. And what they found was they looked at metformin, sulfonyl ureas, DPP-4 inhibitors, GLP-1 analog, insulin, and TZDs. We all we already know from one of the largest studies that people taking insulin are at increased risk, probably the duration of diabetes is more. There are multiple comorbidities. The increased factor is recently observed with TZD therapies of great concern in the elderly patient. Please avoid TZD therapy in patients because it affects and deteriorates effects on the bone health. We all know it's a deteriorates effect on bone health and osteoporosis and the tendency to have more fractures. However, we also know that the one of the other important factor from this is intensive glycemic control is a risk factor for falls. We show we saw uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Srivatsa telling us that what should be the guidelines as uh, or the glycemic control goals. We should relax the glycemic control goals, not have intensive control or glycemic control as the patient ages and hypoglycemia is also an increased risk of force. This can be severe hypoglycemia. Patient having um, uh, halves doesn't have or hypoglycemic awareness, unawareness and has a severe hypoglycemia, severe neuro, has a throat in a seizure, falls unconscious at somewhere and there's an increased risk of factors. Now, how do we prevent that? And to prevent it, we have this ACCO indicators, assessing care of vulnerable elders. So there are 12 factors. These are based on evidence-based focus on most 182 articles. And what they said is all vulnerable elders should have an annual documentation. That means anybody who is vulnerable, every diabetic is a vulnerable patient. If he's on insulin, if he's on having peripheral neuropathy, if one el basically any elderly person about the occurrence of recent falls. Falls are common, preventable, frequently unreported, often cause injury can restrict activity unnecessarily. A recent fall, if somebody had one fall, believe me, they're going to fall again. Please assess the cause for the fall. And how do you assess, cause, assess the cause? We can use this ACOB indicator to assess and need some multi-factor. It is not one factor. There are multiple factors. Let's go. If you have this, this multi-factor risk fall assessment, if you do this, you will have 18% fewer falls and 37% of fewer or fewer of any falls within a fall risk ass assessment program. They assess this program. The idea of this program is good is because the number of falls which you're going to do is less. So the fall risk assessment features medication review, orthostatic blood pressure measurement, vision assessment, gait and balance evaluation, cognitive evaluation, assessment of environmental factors, assessment of muscle strength. You need to take the circumstances, the medication, the chronic condition, mobility status, alcohol intake, psychotropic substance intake. You can use all the positive to tailor a fall prevention specific for each individual. The fall in everybody is different and there is a different cause. It is not the same. So we can't bear this alone. So if you have indicator three, that is more than one fall because of ortho, orthostatic hypertension, please reassess every three months that it doesn't have ortho, orthostatic hypertension and whatever the cause need to be addressed. If there is documentation that there's a visual activity, problem with visual activity, one of the commonest things for a fall, they cannot assess where they keep it. And you should do this again and again to make sure his visual and take care of his vision and then reduce fall. And there is difficulty in ambulation. If you have more than two falls and the worsened difficulty is with ambulation, balance of mobility, then you should document, look at the gait, balance and strength evaluation within three months of the report and do the necessary test. And how do you do gait and balance? Time to get up and go test. It's the simplest thing which you can do at the, the clinic. Patient walking into your clinic, sitting on the chair, going back itself will give you an assessment of the uh, gait and also some, some like some at some to some extent frailty, single leg standards, dynamic gait index, birth balance, they're all questionnaires available. You can have a look at that and document them. Indicator, if you have more than two falls because of a cognitive assessment, memory loss or dementia, we saw this, you need to find out, you need to go into depth of this and look at this particular distance because this is also an important part of the uh, a fall. And then if anybody has a vulnerable history of fall at home because of an extrinsic factor or because there is some sort of uh, change which you want to make at home, steps, bathroom flooring, no hand railings for them to hold on. They are innumerable, we all know them, slippery full flows, 
So the injury might make that necessary changes. Bathroom, ba age, non-step entrance, covered parking, this can go in on and on. So some of the things where you need to make sure that you have this while getting up from this using, there are many things I'm not going to do. Unsafe bathrooms are one of the commonest things for fall. Ninth indicator, use of medications, especially medications which work on the uh, CNS, S benzodiazepines. People take a lot of drugs, um, all the drugs which has some sort of effect on the CNS, please ensure that they are not the one which is causing the imbalance or the cause for the fall and tailor these medications appropriately so they do not cause a fall again. So review all medications. They are on polypharmacy. Modify psychotropic medication and discontinue if inappropriate, appropriate, rationalize all drugs taken. And another thing is poor balance and proprioception, which I told you is very, very important. And acid devices, uh, if I have more than two falls, if they are using any acid devices, please recheck them even with that if they are going to have uh, a fall. Need to assess that. Also. And then there's another thing. This is called fear of falling, or you can call something like uh, pre-frailty. So here, people with the fear of fall will have activity restriction and perceived pure health, reduced strength and poor balance, increased stability, reduced interdependence, and increased fall risk, poor quality of life. Off of those, and fear of falling may not always precipitate activity restriction. Half of those who report fear of falling do not restrict activities, but lack of social support, which is, I think, is the greatest thing in today's world. There's nobody, many people are living alone. I think it's a bigger challenge and another day for discussion. Depressive symptoms, multiple falls, and presence of more than two chronic conditions are associated with fear of induced activity restriction. So in summary, one of the most important things is extremely important try to prevent falls. If there is a fall, take him as an high-risk individual for another fall. So like a high-risk foot, high-risk individual for another fall. Assess using the Uncov score. What is the reason for his fall? And based on it, please correct it. Whatever it could be, medication, cognition, orthostasis, vision, gait, balance, hypoglycemia. Encourage exercise to improve muscle strength and balance. Consider assist devices. They are assist devices and they're still falling. Reevaluate them. Use home safety assessments to improve their safety at home. Screen for fear of falling. Counsel to improve mobility. The most important thing and not spoken most, appropriate footwear. Most of our elderly people walking in would not have using, they're not using appropriate footwear, which is which will help them to get, walk better, balance better, and prevent a fall. Thank you for your patient listening. Thank you, Thank Dr. Sanjay Reddy. I think uh, you have put in a lot of uh, information in such a short time, very relevant information. I, I, I would like to say at this stage, before we uh, throw open for discussion, that why we chose this webinar. The reason is that all these three conditions, they are seen in the geriatric practice quite commonly. But the physicians in the community, they do not much understand about the implication of these and when they happen along with a disease like diabetes. That is first reason. The second reason is that over the years, increasingly new guidelines are being propounded about the glycemic goals for various kinds of such morbidities, particularly dementia and frailty. The third reason why we said uh, that we should have this webinar, that all the three conditions are highly preventable if we take appropriate step at proper stages. And I think all the three esteemed speakers have uh, given a lot of emphasis on prevention. That is the third reason. And just few, very few small comments about the falls uh, and particularly fracture. The, there is a lot of information about the bone density in diabetes. And paradoxically, bone density in diabetes is actually increased, not decreased. In spite of increased bone density, they are more vulnerable to fractures. And the reason why it is said the reason is that if you measure there what is called trabecular score, the architecture of the bones, 
that is weaker in them. That is one reason. And second reason, there are a lot of non-skeletal causes of faults in the diabetic. They have, for example, they may have diminished vision. They would be demented. They may have also have hearing impairment. They are frail. And as Dr. Reddy says, they have polypharmacy. All these things are actually contributing to falls in diabetes, which is happening more than in non-diabetic elderly. That is about the falls. With regard to the, the frailty, I think I would like to share a very recent paper which I was going through by Dr. Sinclair from England. Dr. Sinclair is one of the pioneers who put down several years before the guidelines for treatment of elderly diabetics with glycemic goals and all that. Now he comes out and says, in uh, opposition to what has been usually believed, that frailty people should not be getting weight-losing anti-diabetic drugs because they are already frail. But what Dr. Sinclair says, he has now divided the frail patients into two categories, frail diabetic patients. One, he says, AM, that is an an uh, anorexic, malnourished, thin. And second category, he says, SO, that is sarcopenic obese frailty. And he says that when they are sarcopenic obese frailty, they are overweight, but they are actually frail. Their muscle power is very less. Muscle mass is very less. In those patients who are overweight, you can still use SGLT2 or um, GR, uh, G, uh, this uh, receptor yeah. agonist. You can still use it. But those which are... Uh, the AM type, the anorexic malnourished type, you should not use this. So he has further dissected the indications of these drugs into frailty subclassification. And about the dementia, of course, Dr. Ambali has already very clearly uh, emphasized the importance of uh, different stages. So I think th this is, I think if the message goes that these are the preventable conditions, the physician has to be aware of these conditions, I think the job is well done. Thank you very much. And now it is open for four. We still have about 11 minutes at our disposal. So I think anyone would like to uh, comment. Anyone, please. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, the, all of these conditions, although they are the uh, most prevalent conditions, however, uh, there is very less focus on these conditions, especially in our meetings, I think. The healthcare provider needs to be sensitized first before we go in for primordial or primary prevention areas. For, for this particular reason, uh, when our uh, interest group is going to meet in uh, Bhubaneswar, one of the topics we have chosen for a flash talk is only a five minute talk by Dr. Ambali. He is going to discuss comprehensive geriatric assessment which is an office procedure and the whole intention of this assessment for an elderly individual is to find out uh, many, many impairments, including these three impairments, what we have discussed today. Because once a physician develops a habit of assessing an elderly person in his clinic, then he knows where he stands. Is he in a pre-frail stage or is a mild cognitive impairment to begin with or he is liable to fall or those who are already advanced so he can take appropriate steps for handling such situations as they come to his clinic. So we are looking forward to that presentation. In addition, there are other flash talks also. So I think that is uh, as far as my take is concerned. Dr. Jetwani, would you like to say anything? I would like to ask all three uh, speakers to give some take-home message to the physicians. For First, Dr. Anand, what will be the ideal clinical screening test to identify individuals where you will subject them to further tests for dementia. What is the yes, first sir. thing that you will do in clinic so that you can identify this individual requires further mm -hmm. assessment for dementia? Yes, sir. So we practice and uh, recommended this three-item recall test in a clinical scenario. While taking history itself, we uh, do the three-item recall test. And after completing our examination, we tell them to recall those three words or three items shown. And if all three are positive, fine. No need for cognition involvement. If only answer is one is right uh, and uh, patient is uh, having other symptoms also, we subject them for detailed evaluation for cognition like MOCA or MMSC or Edinburgh. 
and we have to also Same. find out the other uh, reversible causes for uh, forgetfulness or dementia like thyroid disorders vitamin b12 deficiencies especially in patients with metabolic backgrounds dr anuba from your point regarding frailty yes sir i will definitely agree with vinod sir uh, how we saying like we need to assess the frail patients uh, as uh, dr ambari was suggesting we uh, all the patient like some uh, talk about or question him about exhaustion fatigability weight loss just simple test uh, uh, timed up getting up from the chair walking around and sitting back on the chair a 4 meter walk test this is simple test which can assess frailty or a pre frailty in an individual certain questionnaire to assess the clinical uh, frailty score can be helpful in assessing and dividing them in uh, where where sarcopenic ones with the weight loss people are concerned up a rational uh, medication can be decided or a right way of treatment can be chosen in these group of drugs where you can prevent falls also and hence the well being of the patient may be improved i think we welcome dr bansi sabu and dr amit gupta who are the brain behind this interest groups from diabetes india welcome sir <laughs> thank you thank you reading sir reading <laughs> well i would say it is dr. not dr. Sanjay, the brain behind uh, it is the heart behind uh, also <laughs> yes yes so sanjay what is the one thing that you will evaluate on the first visit in clinic that to identify uh, individuals who are at risk of poor done a small thing what we do first is patient walking into the clinic with support or without support one he is whether he is walking with an attender or not if he is holding the attender or he is walking confidently and coming and sitting in the chair in front of you first the second thing which i want to look at is footwear and third is his eyesight these are simple things all other things are something which i need to go back and check about his history and all of the the thing the most important and the most the best test i like is he coming and sitting my chair and going back and opening mm. the door this will assess four things one muscle strength two coordination three walking speed fourth vision fifth Uh, and um, most important is look at look at his footwear majority of the people who fall have come into the clinic with a number these five things is important and once you have a fall and he is a history of fall put a red mark pehla din you ke baad on to the k sheet and say okay you are at increases we looked at the data so this, it is so alarming that if you have a fall and a fracture and your recurrent life mortality is very high so something like a red mark on the k sheet or to indicate that this individual has a fall these are the five things which i look for when they come in all of the things are there in the k sheet to assess and never miss to look for especially for orthostatic hypertension this is one of the most common and the most common complaint which is there is sir i get up from bed i feel uh this this we document these simple all of this are covered when you do but, but just walking into the uh, clinic these are the things which we assess to make sure that uh, we, this person is going to have a fall or dr bansi okay. would you like you. to say anything <laughs> sir i just want to add few things which are very important clinically which i always feel that uh, now it's a time that we should learn all the diabetologists and all the doctor and physician there should be a classroom to clinic we talk so much in classroom but many of mm -hmm. us we don't follow in our clinic when mm -hmm. we see the patients i have seen the busy clinicians and diabetologist they hardly bother for any other thing they talk very nicely that we should not have a glucocentric approach we should do all other things and they don't do in their clinical practice and similarly we see those young doctors very good when they come to give the talk they they can talk on anything but they don't do in their clinical practice even though they have a time and they don't want to listen other also so i mean this interest group the complete idea is that whatever we are listening whatever we are discussing each one of us should try to follow all those things in our day to day clinical practice because in last 25 years even we have done so much so 
but still the average A1C could not be improved and we could not do many more things for our diabetic patients. So this is the time that we should take a, a oath in Diabetes India that it's a time that we are, whatever we are learning in classroom, in conference, we should apply in our clinic also. This is very important because this is the journey of my 25 years in field of diabetes and I am seeing the prescriptions of all those seniors and all those juniors, which I can call them, but is still not able to find the best of the best treatment. Um, otherwise, I mean, the sarcopenia and the frailty, these are very important topics which we are just neglecting, particularly for the elderly people and we find them, I mean, uh, by diabetologist, how many of you are really writing the prescription for osteoporosis? How many of us are uh, sending the patients for physiotherapy, asking them for a, all those regular checkups, postural hypotension, the blood pressure yeah. monitoring. Even after a newcomer who comes to my clinic as a post-MD, we ask them, have you checked the blood pressure of the person after asking him to stand? They have not done in their clinical practice of last four years, not a single time. And this is the MD who has passed MD medicine and this is the scenario. So, I mean, nothing to, I'm not criticizing here anyone, but this is just to tell that we should do more and more such activities just to improve the care for our diabetic patients. Thank you, sir. But I would also like to say that these messages, they have to pass from a clinic to a patient home. Of course, that is very important. But the second thing I, I would like to raise here that the uh, interest groups that have been created and they are discussing with each, with each other many many things which normally people don't discuss. We are actually are able to go into the depth of very, very practical issues and more knowledge is coming, not only from the, uh, from the point of a medical knowledge, but even wisdom is coming. And this wisdom, I think one has to distinguish the knowledge from wisdom. And the wisdom very has true, to sir. pass. Wisdom has to pass to the patient. Because by is, I can not... say that I am becoming more wiser and probably my practice will definitely improve. I am learning a <laughs> lot yeah. by all these interest group and I am the part of all the interest group and I am very much regular reading. Yeah. I know that the Pratap is very, very serious student from Gujarat and same with Akash because I know about the Akash that in midnight he read every day. But many of us are reading, you know, uh, some newer data and something, but you know, some minor things we are really missing in our day-to-day -day clinical practice. So this interest group will definitely improve our knowledge and we will be able to use this knowledge in our clinical practice. That's very important. From classroom to clinic, it should come. I agree with you, Bansi. Anyone else? Totally yes, agree yes. with you. Yes. Uh, anybody, Dr. Uh, Dr. Akash, you want to say anything? The chairperson of the webinar today? I think I think in this uh, Diabetes India group meeting, we should come up with a project to screen the patients. Uh, we can involve a lot of other healthcare providers uh, for dementia, frailty, and pulse. So we should make a comprehensive. I will come up with a uh, study plan to study all these aspects in the clinic setting so that we can at least have a large study where we can study all these aspects. There is a proposal to uh, prepare a position paper uh, uh, on many of these aspects. And no, uh, uh, no, 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 we, uh, yes. we just study the privilege presently and then we can go about the next other things. Okay. Akash, okay. we have already done that retrospective data analysis and we are planning to do one prospective data analysis with focus on this particular so uh, attention on this geriatric syndromes, that polypharmacy, frailty, <laughs> falls, urinary incontinence, dementia. So we will do something regarding that and next year, probably from February or March onwards, we will do prospective study to identify oh, these parameters. Are we going to present or... this? Are we going to project this? I mean, as a project in this Diabetes India from uh, this group? Yes, yes. 
So we have yes, already yes, done yes, one yes, retrospective sir. analysis, and now we are planning to do one prospective. Great, great. So I think we are right on dot. It's eight fifteen. If uh, can we request Dr. Jetwani to uh, please give the vote of thanks? Yes, sir. Ankit, are there any questions from the audience or participants? Ankit? Yes, sir. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. There is one question. Yes, please go ahead. So the what could be the mechanism of insulin therapy predisposing an elderly to dementia by Dr. Ripur? So Dr. Anand. Yes, sir. Insulin uh, is known to produce, uh, especially its effects on uh, uh, brain uh, as an uh, insulin uh, hypersensitivity or uh, insulin resistance that takes place. So it happens when hyperinsulinemia or insulin resistance when appears in the uh, CNS, it leads to accumulation of amyloid plaques. Uh, that is the one uh, proposal uh, hypothesis. And the uh, second one is uh, insulin leading to hypoglycemia. Uh, that affects, again, the uh, brain tissue damage and multiple episodes of hypoglycemia is uh, another risk factor for developing dementia. So these are the two issues, how the insulin takes up uh, leading to dementia in the older people. Second Another question. question is, sir, can we give PioMet and DPP-4 in diabetes? But uh, how to treat forgetfulness? Yes, forgetfulness is a symptom. And uh, we need to uh, uh, evaluate what exactly it is. It's just a forgetful of aging or it is a minimal cognitive inhibition, uh, minimal cognitive cognition, or there is a dementia. So in this aspect, again, if you get uh, minimal cognition, uh, there impairment is there. Then again, uh, we have to we can prevent it going for the dementia. We have to look for uh, reversible causes of uh, uh, dementia in especially in the setting of diabetes uh, mellitus because one of the metabolic syndrome again uh, hypothyroidism, vitamin B12 deficiency, uh, and old stroke, old vascular events can all uh, lead to dementia. So the question starts is how to uh, how to uh, treat forgetfulness. Yes, it depends upon what's the cause and there is no uh, clear cut like uh, forgetfulness is there. We have to uh, counsel him. And is it the first counseling of forgetfulness aging? If not, go for next uh, minimal cognition impairment. Then we have to evaluate him. And then uh, if it is again, in, is it in reversible or reversible, then irreversible cause. Uh, go ahead for again uh, further evaluation for full plunge dementia, uh, maybe it's Alzheimer's or frontotemporal or vascular like that. Or if it is reversible, treat the patient with uh, reversible conditions, especially the correction of uh, hypothyroidism and vitamin B12 deficiencies. Frequent uh, history of uh, alcohol intake is there and smoking with has to be stopped uh, because that also has an uh, irreversible uh, causes. Uh, for dementia older people. So again, it depends upon what is the cause for the dementia and then we have to treat it accordingly. Thank well, you. I think uh, there is a comment I would like to say. Uh, well, of course, uh, a very short answer is that if there is a full flight forgetfulness, there is no drug mm -hmm. which can treat forgetfulness. Yes. But it can certainly be prevented. And yes. if some forgetfulness has happened, its progression can be prevented, it can be retarded. Yes, and sir. There are two things, apart from what Dr. Ambali has said, there are two things I would like to say. I think there is a role of what is called cognitive challenging. All the elderly people or the people who are going to be elderly, about say 55 or 60, who are going to be retired at some time, they should continue to challenge their brain by all kinds of brain stimulating activities. Okay. I don't want to go into the detail of these activities, but that is number one. Number two, a very important thing that one has to be socially very interactive. If people are extrovert, meeting friends and relatives, attending events, and, and, and we are, of course, attending so many conferences, that is also one of the good things. So social connectiveness and cognitive challenging 
is a very important aspect for preventing an elderly person to get forgetful or even dementia. That is what my take is. Thank you, sir. Amit, would you like to make any comment? Thank you. Thank you, sir. I would just like to say that uh, it was a fantastic webinar and the theme of triple uh, 3F is really uh, very, very, uh, we learned a lot of things as rightly pointed out by uh, Vinod Kumar, sir, as well as Bansi, sir, that uh, we need to take these things into our clinical practice. And uh, the and this is uh, exactly what was the idea behind creating these interest group was that we can have more deep discussions, more uh, discussions on topic which are usually just touched in many of the meetings or uh, are not the part of the routine uh, discussion. So I think uh, uh, we are on the right track and we learned a lot. And with this uh, webinar, I think all of us have become more wise and wiser. we would try to wiser and we would try to use uh, these uh, 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 pulse of uh, clinical practice, which we have picked up from this discussion. We will try to incorporate them in our clinical practice. So once again, Vinod Kumar, sir, uh, this group is really rocking and this group is really doing a lot of good activities and at the top of the chart and uh, is very close to me <laughs> and I really appreciate all the work you do. Thank you, sir. I, I don't know how Thank many you. people have attended this, but if recording has already been done, I Amit, mean, is it possible to disseminate yes, this recording at, to a large yes, sir. audience? We will, yes, sir. sir, we will get the recording and we will uh, send it to all the audiences. Good, and good. We, will, uh, we can circulate it to all the groups. So I think the Thank you, Amit. Dr. Detwani, the floor is yours now. Yes, yes. Thank you, Dr. Amit. First of all, let me thank Dr. Bansi and Dr. Amit for sparing their time and joining for this groups, this webinar. And Dr. Vinod Kumar, sir, for guiding and leading yes. from the front and creating this concept of 3F, that is forgetfulness, frailty, and falls in elderly diabetics. I think we all know about medicine but we forget, we generally keep on intensifying therapies, even in elderly mm. people. But these yeah. are the three important issues, frailty, forgetfulness, and false. If they are there in your elderly people, then you have to de-intensify therapy. Mm. Rather than intensifying Intensive. therapy, you have to de-intensify therapy, and you have to give them uh, whatever glycemic control is there, but better quality of life, because that is the important parameter in elderly diabetics. I thank Dr. Akash Singh for moderating the session. Dr. Anand for an excellent uh, lecture on forgetfulness, Dr. Anuba on frailty, and Dr. Sanjay for getting us through the falls, not only in diabetics, but even in elderly, how can we prevent falls even if they are not there? So I think with that, we end our seminar. Uh, and probably in next two months time, we will again come with our third webinar. And I will request Dr. Vinod Kumar to think of the title of that webinar. It should also be catchy like this three Fs, because this is what is required in a routine clinical practice for a physician to understand the importance of these conditions, which we generally miss in routine clinical practice. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Okay. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I also thank, thank RX events, Nirav, Ankit, Neelam, Thanks. and Hardik for providing that technical support for this. Event. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, you so much, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good night, sir. Bye.